Good day, everyone, and warmly welcome to this press conference, where we will soon present the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel for 2013. We keep to our pretty old tradition to start in Swedish and then continue in English, and then when there are questions, you can post them in either language. Ja, jag heter Staffan Nordmark. Jag är ständig sekreterare vid Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin. Och med mig här till höger har jag professor Per Krusell som är ordförande i ekonom ekonomipriskommittén och professor Torsten Persson som är ledamot i kommittén. Och till vänster om mig sitter professor Per Strömberg, också ledamot i ekonomipriskommittén. Och de ska strax berätta mer om vad priset handlar om. Årets ekonomipris handlar om förutsägbarhet. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att utdela Sveriges Riksbanks pris i ekonomisk vetenskap till Alfred Nobels minne år 2013 till professor Eugene Fama vid University of Chicago, USA och professor Lars Peter Hansen vid University of Chicago, USA och professor Robert Schiller vid Yale University, New Haven, USA. Och prismotiveringen lyder för deras empiriska analys av tillgångspriser. This year's prize in economic sciences is about predictions. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel 2013 to Professor Eugene Fama from University of Chicago, USA, US, and Professor Lars Peter Hansen from University of Chicago, USA, and Professor Robert Schiller from Yale University, New Haven, USA. And the Academy citation runs for their empirical analysis of asset prices. Professor Crusell will now give us a short summary in English, please. Thank you, Stefan. So this year's prize in economic sciences honors empirical findings about the price movements of assets such as stocks and bonds. In the 1960s and 70s, Eugene Fama established that prices are extremely hard to predict over shorter horizons. He also demonstrated how new information such as dividend announcements gets incorporated very quickly into prices. In sharp contrast, in the early 1980s, Robert Schiller discovered significant predictability over longer horizons. When asset prices are high relative to dividends, they tend to be followed by low returns over the following three to seven years. How should these predictability findings be interpreted? Lars Hansen's key contribution was to develop and apply a new statistical method, the generalized method of moments, to evaluate the standard theory of asset pricing. He found that the standard theory, which views investors as rational, had great trouble explaining the data. This gave rise to intense research efforts. The approach which, which Hansen and others uh, pursued is based on time-varying dividend risk and risk aversion. With this approach, low prices can be explained by high perceived risk. And the subsequent high return is then a compensation for the risk. Another approach where <coughs> Robert Schiller has been a, a pioneer can be found in a new area of behavioral finance. The main idea here is that investors' forecasts need not be perfectly rational. Periods of low prices then represent periods of excessive pessimism. So the current understanding of asset prices uh, relies in part on rational investors and their concerns about risk, and in part on psychology and behavioral finance. Farmers, Hansen's and Schiller's research not only radically changed the views among researchers, but also influenced market practice in many ways. Okay, thank you, Professor Crusell. And now I turn to Professor Strömberg to give a more detailed presentation. So, <clears throat> This year's prize is about prices in financial markets, 
And financial market prices are absolutely crucial to the economy because the prices of assets like stocks, bonds, and real estate, they give important signals to firms in what they should be investing in. They give signals to households and what they should save in. Uh, and they also affect how much risk is taking in investments and savings in the economy. So because of this importance of asset prices, it's very important to understand how well these financial markets work in pricing assets. Now, if we look over history, we often see very large fluctuations in asset prices up and down. Uh, one example could be, you know, during the late 90s, we saw technology stocks reach record highs, and then a few years later, dramatic drops in these prices. So it's very important to understand whether these fluctuations in prices are a sign of something not working correctly in, in, in uh, financial markets, because to the extent these fluctuations are due to mispricing, they could have large negative effects on the economy. Now, when you want to understand how well asset prices work, um, predictability, i.e. whether you can foresee how future prices in financial markets are going to evolve, become a central issue. Um, the picture you see here may look like a stock price, price index, but as a matter of fact, it's a completely random series. It's what happens if you flip a coin a number of times and you count the number of tails minus the uh, number of heads. Um, so this is a series that you may see some patterns in, but it's a completely random series. Now, it turns out that if financial markets work well, we would actually expect stock prices, for example, or financial market prices to exhibit exactly the same random behavior. The reason for this is that if financial markets work well, then all the new information about, you know, that's relevant for the future value of these assets should be immediately incorporated in the price so that you, know, you really can't make any money, for example, from reading in the newspaper in the morning that profits of this particular firm is going to be higher in the future because the price will already have adjusted and whatever variation we see that's left is going to be random. So uh, there's one exception to that, however, which has to do with compensation for risk. So assets that are more risky for investors they're going to be less likely or they, they are less willing to invest in those assets. And to induce investors to do that, they need to get a higher return for more risky assets. So we would expect stocks to have a higher return because they're riskier uh, compared to bonds uh, or government bonds that are safer. So all of these issues, the issue of predictability and whether that's consistent with financial markets working, uh, is central to these laureates' work. Uh, and they looked at predictability in the short run, they looked at predictability over the longer run, partly getting somewhat different results, as you've heard. Um, and the importance of this research is that it really greatly improved our understanding of how financial markets work, you know, when markets seem to work well, when they seem to work less well. If we start with Eugene Fama, um, he's really the founding father of this literature. He started uh, doing research in the 1960s on predictability and his focus was on the very short term let's say days or weeks uh, whether you can predict how stock prices are going to do in the future based on historical stock price patterns um, and as we said earlier you know if markets work well historical prices really shouldn't have much to say about how prices are going to move in the future and that's indeed what Gene Fama's early studies found he also uh, helped develop a new method to focus on how quickly uh, does new information get incorporated in prices. So if markets work well, we would expect new information that's relevant about the stock to be more or less instantly incorporated in the price. And this picture here shows you uh, an example of such a study. They're called event studies. Um, and this particular event study looks at how do stock prices react when firms announce that they're going to increase their future dividend. Okay, so that's something good that should make the stock more valuable. And as you see, the zero there is the day when this announcement is made. And what these event studies, by and large, have shown is that you see a pretty much instant adjustment of stock prices to this information on average. Okay, so this is a, a chart of many thousands of such announcements. But on average, you see that you, know, you basically see no pr particular trend before. You see a rapid adjustment and no particular trend after. So, and this research that Gene Fama pioneered was really incredibly influential and surprising to people at the time. Uh, and, but by the, after these studies, and let's say by the mid to late 70s, there was pretty much consensus among economists that you know, markets seemed to work well, there was not much predictability in prices. Now, 
the person who sort of changed the views for a lot of people here um, uh, in this respect was Robert Schiller. Now, unlike Gene Fama, Robert Schiller looked at predictability over longer horizons, let's say years or even decades. Um, and the first uh, revolutionary finding at the time he found was that it looked like financial market prices, let's say stock prices, were much more volatile. They moved much more than the underlying dividends did. And this was surprising because actually the, if markets work well, we would probably expect the opposite. We would expect dividends and earnings to move around much more than stock prices. And he then went on, uh, together with co-authors, to show that this high movement in stock price, which basically what that means is that sometimes stocks become very expensive compared to the underlying dividends, and sometimes stocks become cheaper compared to um, underlying dividends. And this actually implied that you could predict future movements in, in stock prices. So this um, picture here uh, shows you a measure of how quote-unquote cheap or expensive stocks are. It's basically taking the dividends of the stock US stock market and divide that by the value of the US stock market. So when this is high, when the dividends divided by prices are high, rock, uh, stocks in some sense are relatively cheap, while other periods, you know, we see in the late 2000s during the technology boom, dividend divided by price is very low because prices of stocks are, you know, very high. Now, if you take this measure, dividend over price, and then you see, does that say anything about how stock markets will behave in the, you know, next few years? It turns out it has a very strong uh, predictability pattern here. So in periods when stocks seem relatively cheap, the dividend divided by price is high, you see, and this, uh, this line is sort of the seven-year returns on the stock market following this particular year, you see much higher returns in the stock market following periods where dividends over price is high, uh, and vice versa. Okay. So um, this was you know, uh, a very important finding. It changed uh, the views on predictability uh, of a lot of people. The question is, how should you interpret this? Now, if you look at Fama's findings of not, no predictability in the short term, they were more easy to interpret than these long-term predictability patterns, because of the long term, prices could be predictable not because there's something wrong with them, but actually because they reflect changes in how much compensation investors need for risk. So it could, for example, be that when stocks are cheap and you see subsequent high returns, that's peers when people are not very interested in investing in stocks. They're very averse to the risk in the stock market, and because of that reason, you see a higher return. So um, there was a, uh, we have a standard model for this. It's called the consumption cap M that basically predicts uh, uh, this, this pattern in, in, uh, in prices. Um, however, these models are very hard to test because they are hard to solve, they often rely, in order to solve them you need to make very specific assumptions about how you know, the model works, um, and the relationships you get out of these models are very non-linear and complex. So it's hard to test them. And this is where our third laureate, Lars Hansen, comes in. He uh, first developed a very powerful statistical method which enabled you to test these types of models uh, using very general assumptions. This methodology, which is called GMM, or Generalized Method of Moments, um, turned out not to be, uh, to be important not only for asset price research, but actually uh, all across economics, and has become one of the most widely used empirical methods to study all, all sorts of things in economics. He then went on to take his new theory and test this standard model uh, of, of how expected returns should move over time. And he basically showed that this model I talked about, this sort of rational model of predictability, which says that predictability is driven by people, changes in people's uh, willingness to take risks, that could not explain or give rise to enough fluctuations in prices to be consistent with the theory. So basically, this, this first test actually rejected this standard theory uh, of that, uh, that was based on well-functioning asset markets. Now, together, the research of these three laureates had enormous impact uh, on the way we think about research um, in, and academic research on finance. And, you know, the, the findings on these laureates Obviously, a lot of work went into trying to figure out, you know, is this due to markets not working or are we missing something in, the, in our models? And there are basically two p 
parallel and often complementary research approaches that have emerged after this. One which was pioneered by Robert Schiller is called behavioral finance, and that tries to build off the premise that these large fluctuations and this predictability we see in prices is because investors you know, irrationally, for example, by over-optimism or, or pessimism, price, you know, have the wrong uh, price of assets. Now, for that to work, you also need an additional ingredient, which is that the, there are some, some sophisticated investors that for some reason or the other can't set prices right. They can't benefit from the mistake of these irrational uh, investors. Uh, so a lot of this research has uh, been used to kind of document frictions to financial markets, which makes it hard for sophisticated uh, investors to set prices right. The other track has been to develop, you know, start with, with markets that function, but instead take this standard, very simple standard model that Hansen rejected and try to make it more realistic, try to incorporate more realistic preferences, more realistic market environments, uh, and by now we actually have some models of investor preference that seem much more consistent with, uh, with the uh, results that Schiller found. So, together, actually, so as I said, these, these two approaches are not, uh, are not exclusive and they complement each other. And I think current, this current state of research in, in asset pricing basically finds support for both of these stories. So, in some instances, market work better, the frictionless models work better. In other instances, there are severe market frictions that lead to mispricing in markets. Finally, uh, as Per mentioned, this research is interesting because it has not only influenced academics, but also practitioners in financial markets. Uh, and there are several examples of this, but let me uh, make, uh, highlight one. So the early findings of Eugene Fama that show that it's very hard to predict how stock prices are going to go do in the, in the short run. That basically implied that all these people who spend lots of effort trying to guess which stock is going to do better and which stock is going to do worse, that activity is you know, a very rather futile uh, activity or ex extremely uh, difficult activity. So maybe instead we should just passively invest in a large index because we can do that much cheaper. We don't need to spend so much effort in trying to pick stocks. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, the years after Pharma's research, there was the emergence of this new type of fund, the index fund, which invests in a broad index, a very passive strategy at very low cost. And this has helped, you know, many, many households throughout the world uh, to be able to invest in stock markets much more cheaply than they otherwise could have. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you so much, Professor Strömberg. <coughs> we have got hold of all uh, three laureates. We will now see if we can have uh, Professor Schiller with us on the phone. Are you there, Professor Schiller? Yes, I am. Okay, good morning. Uh, it should be around 7 o'clock, so we've got a morning coffee, uh, and we are right now in New Haven, Connecticut. And I hand over, uh, you know, I'm sitting here in the session hall at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And uh, are you prepared for some questions? Yeah, I don't know if I'm prepared, but I'm here. <laughs> you are yeah. there. Okay, here's one. First one. First of all, congratulations, Mr. Schiller, from the Swedish television. Thank you. Mr. Schiller... What was your reaction when receiving the telephone call from the Nobel Prize Committee announcing the award? I, could, I couldn't disbelieve. That's the only way to put it. <laughs> so was it expected, in a way? I, I'm sorry? Was it what? expected? Did you expect it, the telephone well, call? Well, I have a, a, I, a lot of people have told me they, they hoped I would win it. <laughs> but I'm aware that there are so many other worthy people that I had discounted it. So I would say, no, I did not expect it. So please, Mr. Schiller, tell us all the reasons for your interest in this field of economic theory. Well, I've, well, <laughs> I've interested in a million different things. I was attracted to economics, I think, because it deals with really important problems. It's a, it's a, Rigorous discipline. Finance drew me in because uh, it's so fundamental to human activity. And it follows precise mathematical uh, uh, relations. But there's an element of imprecision in it that re re reflects human nature. Altogether, I found it a fascinating and important field. I know it's early in the morning, but 
What does this prize mean to you and your profession? Well, I, okay, I, I believe that uh, for all speaking, I'm trying to for all three of us that uh, finance is a theory that, while it has many controversial elements, also has a body of knowledge that is useful <clears throat> for society and it will help improve human welfare. And I'm glad to see that uh, this has been given recognition. Thank you, Mr. Schiller. Okay, do we have <coughs> some more uh, questions here in the room? Okay, uh, if not, uh, yeah, here we have one question, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scheller. Congratulations also, uh, Louise Andrenmeton from uh, Swedish Daily Svenska Dagbladet. Um, if, if you look at the uh, economic situation today that we're having, um, how would you describe that your findings could be best used in today's economic environment? Well, I've written books about this. I have a book called Finance and the Good Society that came out last year. <clears throat> you have to read my book, <laughs> but, but I would say that finance drives modern civilization. This may seem odd to some people, but it's absolutely true. Our best activities have to be financed. And uh, I, I, I want to see finance develop further to serve humankind. Sort of has finance then after the financial crisis sort of ended up well, in well now as, yeah, as for the financial crisis, that reflected mistakes and imperfections in our financial system that we are already working on correcting. I think there's much more to be done. Uh, I think it will take decades. But we've been through financial crises many times in history, and we've generally learned from them. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, I look around. I think that was the last question. And uh, thank you again, Professor Schiller, and uh, warmest congratulations. And we look forward to meet you here in Stockholm in December uh, for all the celebrations. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> so, let us now move uh, to, to uh, some more questions about the prize in economic sciences. Uh, uh, are there any additional questions you would like to pose uh, to the panel here? Okay. If not, uh, I think I will close this uh, press conference and uh, welcome you all to the press events that we have uh, in uh, December 7 and 8 during the Nobel week when all the laureates in physics, chemistry and economic sciences will gather and hold uh, their prize lecture. So well then, uh, see you then and thank you for your attention.